the question I want to answer today at the very first is, can we compute everything? And what do I mean by this? So let's say that I have a fixed alphabet. So let's say I have some alphabet. I'm going to call it sigma. And this is going to be a finite alphabet. Let's say these are all the letters that I can use in my strings and in my programs and so on. So it can just be 0 and 1. Honestly, we can do everything with just 0 and 1. But it doesn't really matter. You can think of this as the English alphabet. You can think of it as all the characters that are available to you in ASCII or in Unicode or anything, as long as this is a finite alphabet. So let's say I have an alphabet. I can define several things. So I can define, for example, a decision problem. What is a decision problem? A decision problem is just a function f that takes any string in this alphabet. Remember that I use sigma star to denote uh, finite sequences of elements in my alphabet sigma. So sigma star means any string in my alphabet. Okay, the set of all strings in my alphabet is sigma star. And maps them to, let's say, true or false or, or zero or one. Okay. So this is going to be a decision problem. Basically, I give you some input. You either accept the input or you reject it. You either return true or false, one or zero. Okay. Now, if I have a decision problem, I can also think of it as a language. And a language is just a bunch of strings. So a language is just any subset L of my strings. Now, it's pretty obvious that every decision problem gives me a language and every language gives me a decision problem, right? So if I have a function f that takes a string and gives me true or false, I can consider all the strings whose f value is true, and I can say this is the language of this function. Similarly, if I have a language, if I have a set of strings, I can define a decision problem. I can say return true if the string that I'm giving you is in this set, otherwise return false. Okay, So these two are pretty much the same thing. We don't really distinguish between them that much. But I can also have all sorts of other problems. For example, in this course, we've seen a lot of optimization problems where you get some input and you don't have to just return true or false. You have to actually return some optimal output. Right. So in these cases, I can consider all the functions that take some string as their input, and then they return some other string. Okay. So both the input and the output are going to be strings. Now, I don't really need other data types because any kind of data can be encoded as a string. So if my input is a graph, I'm um, anyway typing that graph as a string, right? So I can think of it by, by just choosing some suitable encoding as a string. And my output can also be a string. OK. So when I ask, can we compute everything? Actually, I can formalize this in different ways now, right? So for example, I can say, is there an algorithm or a program that computes the function f for any decision problem f. OK. Or I can also say the same thing in terms of a language. So if I give you a language, is there an algorithm that decides membership in this language? For example, I tell you my language is the language of all graphs that are bipartite. OK. Is there an algorithm that reads an input and returns true if the input is a bipartite graph, according to some standard encoding, of course, and returns false otherwise. Well, the answer here is yes. But then for this particular language, I know that I have an algorithm. I know that I can write a program in C++ that does this. But can I do this for any language? OK. Or more generally, if I give you any function, if I give you any function f, is there an algorithm, let's say A of F, that computes F, that takes the inputs of F and produces the outputs of F? So this is what I mean when I ask, can we compute everything? Okay. But let's just focus on languages for now, because the rest of it is actually quite similar. So 
The question I have is this. Does there always exist an algorithm? Let's call it A sub L for every language L. Or, okay, let me put the for every language L at the beginning. For every language L, does there always exist an algorithm A sub L such that if I run this A sub L on some input on X, it returns true if and only if X is in the language L. Can I always have such an algorithm? And of course, I need to add some extra condition here as well. I want my algorithms to terminate, right? So I want the runtime of this algorithm A to be finite. I don't care how much time it takes, but it has to produce something. It cannot run forever. I cannot have, for example, uh, a while loop in my algorithm that just keeps going on forever and ever. So such that AL terminates on X, let's say AL terminates on every input and on a given input X, it returns true if and only if X is in the language L. If we have such an algorithm, we say that A decides L. Basically, for every input, it decides whether the input is in L or not. Okay. Now, in order to answer this question, we have to actually have a good definition of what an algorithm is. And we haven't had that until this point in our course. We were just assuming that you all know what an algorithm is. So I'm going to continue with the same assumption. So whenever I'm writing algorithm here, just imagine I'm talking about a program in C++. OK, so let's say when I say, does there exist an algorithm, I'm asking, is there a C++ function or a C++ program that can do this? Okay. Now, the answer is no. There are actually tons of languages for which we cannot have algorithms. Now, for those of you who have taken some more mathematical courses, you can probably do a counting argument here. Because here's the thing, if I look at my algorithms, if I look at my C++ programs, every C++ program is itself a string, right? So how many different C++ programs can I write? Of course, the number is infinite. I can write infinitely many different programs, but it's countable, right? So the set of C++ programs is countably infinite. But if you look at your set of languages here, or the set of decision problems, or even the set of these functions, they're actually uncountable. So if you've passed courses on set theory, you already know that the answer cannot possibly be yes. But we don't want to do that here, because we are computer scientists. We're not mathematicians. It's not yet. So let's find a particular language for which we cannot have a program, OK? And this is what Alan Turing called the halting problem. Okay. So this problem is like this. Suppose that I give you the code of a different program as input. And I also give you the input that should be given to that program. Okay. So my input is going to consist of two parts, a program P. Remember that my programs are themselves strings. And in my input, I can give any string. So in my input, I can just give a program. For example, I, I have a CPP file. That is my C++ program. I can use that file as the input to another program. Right? That's perfectly fine. So in the halting problem, my input consists of a program P and some string. Let's call this one X. And the output 
should basically say whether the program P terminates on X. So if I run the program P and give it the input X, will the program P terminate or not? Okay. So I want to output yes or true if px terminates. So if I give x as an input to the program p, it terminates. Now, I don't say it terminates in polynomial time or in a particular amount of time. I'm just saying it terminates. As long as it doesn't take infinite time, as long as there is a point where this program p, when given the input x, terminates, my halting problem's output should be yes. And of course, it should be no otherwise. Now, one small technical detail. If this input program P is not a valid input, I just assume that it always terminates. So if I give you a program that doesn't even compile, for example, that terminates, okay? So this is the problem that we wanna solve. So basically, this is a decision problem, of course, because we are outputting yes or no, but our input now contains another program. Or another way to visualize this is, can you write a C++ program that takes the code of another C++ program and the input that should be given to the second program and tells you whether the second program terminates on that input or not? Okay. Now, I'm going to prove to you that this is impossible, that you can never have a C++ program that solves the halting problem. So, Let's try to code this. So let's say I have halting.cpp. So what would a program like this look like? I mean, I call it a program, but you can think of it as a function, right? Whatever you can do in the whole C++ program, you can also do it in one function. So let's say that I have a function that returns a Boolean, and this function is called halting or halt. And it takes two things. It takes the code of another program as a string. So P is another C++ program. And it also takes a string X, which is supposed to be uh, the input to the program P. Okay. Now, I don't know how this halting function works, but it's magic. So it returns true if PX terminates. And of course, halt itself always terminates, right? Because I could easily write a function halt that just simulates the program P. But then if P doesn't terminate, halt also doesn't terminate. So that's cheating, that's not acceptable, right? So I want this halt to always terminate. Halt itself always terminates. Again, I don't have any bounds on the runtime. I'm not saying it terminates in polynomial time or anything, I just say, if you give it two strings p and x, it will eventually return either true or false to you. It cannot run forever. OK. Now, assuming that I have this magic function, I want to somehow get a contradiction. OK. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to write another function. Let's say this is a void function, and I'm going to just call it g. OK. And let's say that this function also takes some input. So I'm going to call it i. That's the input to my function. OK. Now, here's how I write this function. I say call the function halt with the input i twice. OK. And if the result was true, then just do an infinite while. That's my function. G. Now, it's a crazy function, I understand that, but, well, I can write this, right? If the function halt exists, which is my assumption, then I can write this function g. Now, what does this function g do? It just takes some string i as input, and it just calls halt of i i. So it asks, what happens if I give the code of program i to itself as input? Would the program i terminate if I give its code to itself as input or not? And if i terminates on itself, then g just runs an infinite loop. Okay, 
That's it. That's all that I'm writing. Now, here's the interesting part. What do I know about GI? So if I call G on a string I, when does GI terminate? So if this if goes through, then G goes into an infinite loop and doesn't terminate, right? But if the condition here is false, then this G just terminates because it never goes into the loop. So GI terminates if and only if I, I does not terminate. And this holds for every string i. So I can say for every string i, if I call the function g with the input i, g terminates if and only if function i itself or program i itself an input i does not terminate. OK. Do you see a contradiction here? Well, the contradiction is that I could write G itself like this, right? So G itself is a program. And we said that every program is a string. So what happens if I give the code of G to itself? So what happens to G of G? So I write G itself as a string and I pass it to the function G. So here, basically, because this holds for every string i, it should also hold for the case where i is equal to g. So I get that g of g terminates if and only if g of g does not terminate. That's a contradiction. And I got that contradiction by assuming that there is a function halt. So this contradiction shows that you cannot have any such function halt. This just doesn't exist. So. In these cases, we say that the halting problem is not computable or it's undecidable. There is no algorithm that can solve the halting problem. And again, the proof was pretty easy. I mean, this is also very genius because I think Turing did this during World War II. So everyone was fighting. This guy was thinking about this. Uh, but yeah, so this is undecidable. Because Again, just look at the argument one more time. We said that if anyone can come up with such a function halt, then I can create a function g here that would actually give me a contradiction. So this is a proof by contradiction. I'm just saying that if a solution to this exists, if an algorithm exists for the halting problem, then I will always get a contradiction. So this proves that there is no algorithm for the halting problem. OK. So now we have a problem because we have this mathematical concept of functions and languages and like mapping inputs to outputs. And then we have the computational concept of an algorithm or let's say a C++ program. And we just saw that they're not the same thing, right? Uh, of course, the mathematical definition is more general because whatever algorithm you write will be a special case of this, right? But now we have to somehow characterize what we can actually compute. So we need a model of computation. We need a model of our computers that actually tells us what the computers can do. And this is where we go to your last homework, where we talked about automata. OK. So I'm going to start with the simplest model of computation. And then we're going to see that it's actually not general enough. And then we're going to continue and define another model of computation. And then we will see that this second model of computation, which is called the Turing machine, can actually compute everything, can compute everything that is computable. So something can be computed, let's say, in C++ or any other language, if and only if it can be computed by a Turing machine. But then after that, we're going to focus on a special case of computable functions. And these are functions that are computable in polynomial time. So everything that you have seen until this point in this course was in this really specific and special case where the problem not only could be solved, it could also be solved in polynomial time. And then we will see some uh, 
ways of showing that certain problems cannot be solved in polynomial time. Okay, so this is the overall uh, things that uh, the overview of things that we're going to see today and also in the next session. But for now, let's just start with our simplest model of computation, which is a deterministic finite automata. Okay, or DFA. Okay, what is a DFA? A DFA is basically like a graph, okay? So I say that a DFA is, let's say it's a tuple and it has several parts. So I'm going to have a set of states. So these are all the states that my program or my automaton can be in. So I'm going to have a set Q and I say that Q is a finite set of states. Okay, so I can show them with like Q0, Q1, Q2, maybe up to, let's say Q, I don't know, T. Okay. So my program is always going to be in one of these states. Of course, I'm also going to have an initial state because my program has to start somewhere and I call that Q0. So Q0 in Q is the initial state. Now we said that our programs get an input and our input was supposed to be a string that comes from a particular alphabet. So I'm going to put my alphabet here as well. I'm going to say there is an alphabet. So my automaton can read strings of this alphabet. So sigma is just a finite alphabet. And then I'm going to have a transition function which tells me how I'm going to go between the different states of my program or automaton. So I'm going to have a transition function and I'm going to call that delta. So the idea here is that delta is just a function that says if I'm currently in this particular state and I read one letter of the alphabet from the input, which other state should I go to, okay? I will give you an example really soon, but basically this is a function that takes my current state and it takes a letter of alphabet and tells me what the next state is supposed to be. Okay, and finally, I have a set F, which is a set of accepting states. I honestly don't know why they use F for this, but F is basically just a subset of Q is the set of accepting states. And the idea is that if the program ends in one of the states in F, then I'm going to accept the input. I'm going to return true for the input. And if my program ends in a different state, something that is not in F, then that's the same as rejecting the input or returning zero or false. Okay, so I can, create my DFA and I can show it kind of like a graph. So let's say I have, for example, this DFA. Let's say I have a DFA that has two different states, Q0 and Q1. And let's say my alphabet is also just zero and one. Okay, so I can read strings of zero and one. Now I have to say which state is my initial state. And I mean, I'm calling the initial state Q0 anyway. So let's say I show it like this. This is my initial state. My program or my automaton is always going to start here, okay? Now, the way this works is that if I give some input to the automaton, for example, let's say my input is 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0. It's going to start at state Q0 and it's going to read the first letter of the input. And based on that, it's going to decide where to go, okay? So for example, suppose that from Q0, 
I have an edge to Q1 labeled with one, and I have an edge that goes back to Q0 labeled with zero. This means that if I'm at state Q0 and I read the first character of my input, which was zero in this case, I'm going to stay at Q0, okay? Now I read the second character of my input, which is one, I'm at Q0, and if I read one from Q0, I have to go to Q1. Okay, let me add the other edges here as well. Let's say with zero, I stay here, and with one, I come back here, okay? So actually, this is a very compact way of representing my transition function. This was called a transition function. Delta. Basically, it tells me if I'm at Q0 and I read zero, I have to stay at Q0. So I can write it like this. I can say delta of Q0 and zero is Q0, okay? Or I can just add an edge from Q0 to itself labeled with zero. These two are just two different representations of the same thing. And here, like if I'm at Q0 and I read a one from the input, I will go to Q1. So delta of Q0, one is Q1. And I can write the rest of it. Delta of Q1, zero is Q1. And delta of Q1, one is Q0. Okay. So now if I give you any input, that input corresponds to a unique walk on this graph, right? Because you're just going to read the input one character at a time, one letter of the alphabet at a time, and you're going to start at zero. And every time the letter that you read and the current position tells you where you have to go in this graph. Okay, great. So now I have kind of a mini computer. I have something that can compute in the sense that it reads an input and based on the input takes some path or some walk in this graph. But there is another part remaining and this is F. So the set of accepting states. Some of my states are going to be accepting and some of them are going to be rejecting. So in this case, let's say that I say Q1 is accepting. So I show the accepting states by two circles instead of one. And Q0 is not an accepting state. So now I can define the language based on this automaton, right? So for any given input, I can just run my input in this automaton and I can see where I end up at the end of the input. If I end up at an accepting state, I say that I accept this input. So it's the same as saying I'm returning one on this input or returning true on this input. And if I end up in a state that is not an accepting state, I reject this input. So now I can look at the set of all the streams or all the inputs that this automaton accepts. And that's a language, that's the language of this automaton. Okay? So in human understandable terms, what is the language of this particular automaton that I have drawn here? So what strings will be accepted by this automaton? Yes. So basically this automaton pretty much ignores zeros. And whenever I read a one, I go from Q0 to Q1 or from Q1 to Q0. So if I read an odd number of ones, I will end up at Q1 and I will accept. If I read an even number of ones, I will end up at Q0 and I will reject. So this automaton accepts precisely the set of strings that have an odd number of ones. Okay. Now, what if I wanted to accept strings that have an odd number of zeros? I could create something very similar, right? It's just that I count the zeros instead of the ones. But I want to do something more interesting. So let's say that I have a bunch of automata. So let's say, suppose I'm going to take only two. Suppose A1 and A2 are deterministic finite automata, okay? And each of them has a language. So let's say the language of A1 is L1, 
and the language of A2 is L2. So L1 is the set of all strings that are accepted by the first automaton, and L2 is the set of all strings that are accepted by the second automaton. For example, I can take the same automaton here and just imagine that my alphabet is always zero and one for the examples that I'm using here because I don't want to write the alphabet over and over again. So let's say this is my A1. And if this is my automaton A1, then L1 was the set of all strings X. So X in Sigma star such that X has oddly many ones. Okay. Now let's say I create another language or another automaton. I'm going to call this one A2. Okay, this is my automaton. This is my starting state. If I read of one, I go here. 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 Okay. And let's say this is an accepting state. And whenever I read a zero, I remain where I am. And here, actually, if I read a zero, I remain there. And if I read a one, I also remain there. So sometimes when I have two edges that are going from the same vertex to the same vertex and they have different labels, I'm just going to write it like this. It means there are two edges, one with label zero and one with label one. OK, what is the language of this automata? What is L2? Which strings will be accepted here? Again, this automaton pretty much always ignores zeros. If I read a zero, I remain where I am. Every time that I read a one, I'm moving to the right. And I would accept only if I'm stuck in this last position, in this last state. So I need to read at least four ones in order to get here. So this automaton actually accepts all the strings that have four or more ones. So. My language L2 is the set of all strings such that X has four or more ones. Okay. Nice. Now, what's interesting to me is whether I can combine these automata to get different languages. So I know that with a DFA, I can get this language L1. With a different DFA, I can get this language L2. OK. What if I look at the intersection of L1 and L2? Is there a deterministic finite automaton whose language is the intersection of these two languages? OK. So again, remember my problem is that I have A1 and A2. These are DFAs. They have the languages L1 and L2. And the question is that, is there another DFA, let's call it B, such that the language of B is just L1 intersect with L2? Okay, and of course, I'm not asking just for this two particular DFAs, I'm asking in general. So what is the intersection of these two particular languages? So the first language says that I want inputs that have oddly many ones. And the second one says that I want them to have at least four ones, right? So the intersection of them would consist of all the strings that have an odd number of ones, but they should have more than four ones. So five or seven or nine, so on. That's the number of ones that they can have, okay. I want to create a deterministic finite automaton that accepts this intersection. Now, one way I can do this is by just being smart and trying to figure out how to define the automaton, but I want to do it in a more systematic way. So let me just give some names to these states here. So in A1, I call them Q0 and Q1. In A2, let me give them different names. So I'm gonna call this A, B, 
C, D, and E. Now, here's the thing. If I could somehow magically run these two automata in parallel, so if I could give the same input to both of these automata and see where I end up, right? Then when I want to take the intersection, I would say, well, I accept if both of them accept. But I don't have parallel execution. I just have automata, okay? So I have to somehow create this kind of parallel execution. So what do I do? I create a new automaton in which every state is a pair of states corresponding to a state in A1 and a state in A2. So I'm going to have this automaton B and the set of states in B is going to be Q1 times Q2, where Q1 was the set of states in my first automaton and Q2 was the set of states in my second automaton. So I have the states A, B, C, D, E here, and I have, well, I don't want to call them Q0 and Q1 because that's hard to write. So let's say I have 0 and 1 here, right? I'm going to call my states 0 and 1. So green 0 is a letter, but red 0 is a state. OK, so these are my states, 0 and 1. And in the second one, my states are A, B, C, D, E. So what are the states that I'm going to have here? I'm going to have a state called 0a. I'm going to also have 1a. I'm going to have 0b, 1b. 0c, 1c. 0d, 0e. 1d, 1e. So I'm going to create all of these states. Okay. Now this is kind of a huge automaton because I'm taking the product of the two. These are the states that I'm going to have in my automaton. But now, remember, the second component of an automaton was the starting state. Where should I start? Well, this automaton started at 0, and this one started at A. So if I want to simulate both of them at the same time, I want to start here at 0A. Or generally, my starting state is Q01. Q02, right? Okay. Now, I have to also talk about my alphabet. What is my alphabet? My alphabet is going to be the same as before, right? I'm not going to change my alphabet. So my alphabet is the same. Now I have to talk about transitions. So let's say that I'm at a particular state. So let's say I'm at a state 1C. What am I thinking about? I'm thinking that, well, I'm simulating both of these automata at the same time. And my first automaton is in state one and my second automaton is in state C. Now let's say that the next letter that I'm reading from the input is a one. So if it's a one, my first automaton was at state one and it reads a one, it goes to state zero. My second automaton was at C, it reads a one, it goes to state D. I want to simulate both of these actions, right? So from 1C, when I read the 1, I'm going to go to 0D, right? And generally, the way I'm going to do this, let me call this delta, uh, is this. I'm going to say, if I have delta, and let's say I'm at some particular state, I'm at state, uh, I don't know, ST, and I'm reading some letter of the alphabet. I'm reading some letter alpha, okay? Where should I go? Well, I just ask in the first one, in the first automaton, where would I go from the state S if I read alpha? And in the second automaton, where would I go from the state T if I read alpha? So this is the formal definition of my uh, transition function, but I mean, the example is much easier, right? So let's do this, let's add the zeros. So from state zero, if I read zero, I stay in state zero. And from A, if I read zero, I stay there here also. If I read zero, I stay there. Generally in this case, in both of my automata, if I read a zero, I will stay where I am, okay? So this is pretty easy. I know that I have these edges, 
So whenever I read zero, I stay where I am in both of the automata. Okay. Ah, this is painful. A zero, zero, zero. Now, what happens when I read a one? In the first automaton, I will go to the other state, so from zero to one and from one to zero. In the second automaton, I go to the right. So whenever I'm reading one, I should change my track and I should also go right. So if I read a one, I'll go like this, like this, like this, like this. And here, if I read a one, what happens? Well, in the first automaton, if I'm at state zero and I read a one, I will go to one. In the second automaton, if I'm at state E and I read a one, I stay at E. So from zero E, I have to actually go to one E if I read a one, okay? And then again, the same thing on this side. So one, one, I've already added that one. This is one, and then I have a one here. Hopefully I didn't forget anything. This is my product. Okay. It looks terrible. It's meant to look terrible because we don't really want to calculate these things all the time. But now I have to also talk about the accepting states, right? So what is this automaton doing? It's basically simulating both of my original automata, right? And I want to accept if both of my automata accept it. So my first automaton accepts only if I end up in state one and my second automaton accepts only if I end up in state E. So my acceptance state should be one E. That's the only state where I should accept. So this is the only accepting state. Okay. So here I will just have F1 times F2 basically as my acceptance state. Great, so all of this just to show that if there are two different languages that can be modeled or realized by automata, then there is also an automaton that realizes the intersection of these two languages. Okay, but suppose I ask the same thing, but instead of intersection, I ask about union. What happens if I do L1 union L2? Well, I can again simulate both of the automata at the same time, so I can create this product. But now I have to accept a string if even one of the two automata accepts it, right? So let me just take the same construction as before. So this construction, when I start from here and give it a string, it's going to simulate both of my original automata, A1 and A2. But at the end of my string, A1 is going to end up somewhere and A2 is going to end up somewhere else. I want to accept even if one of them is an accepting state. So if I'm either in state one of A1 or state E of A2, I want to accept. So my accepting states would be all the states that have E and also all the states that have one. These are all going to be accepting states, right? And this is now going to accept, this is an automaton for L1 union with L2. Okay. Great. What is, I want to do something else. Let's say, well, I, I've done union, I've done intersection. Can I do XOR? Yeah, I mean, just, you can do basically any Boolean operation here, right? Or let's say I want to do L1 minus L2. I want to accept all the strings that are accepted by the first automaton, but not by the second automaton. I can do that too, right? Just choose your final states wisely. Choose all the final states in which you're accepting in the first automaton, but not accepting in the second. Okay, great. So we know that we have this automata, and of course, everything that has an automaton is computable, because, I mean, should I really convince you that we can do this with computers? 
you know how to write this as a C++ program, hopefully. That just does automata. So we're fine with that. And we know how to do these different operations. But now I'm going to make life really hard. And I'm going to define something new. And this new thing is called non-deterministic finite automata. Okay, so what does deterministic and non-deterministic actually mean? So when I was talking about deterministic finite automaton, I kind of said something without actually writing it down formally. And it was that if you give my automaton any input, it's going to have a unique execution. It's going to give you a unique walk over this uh, particular uh, graph, right? Or, I mean, I can say it for this one too. If I start here, every time that I'm reading a zero or a one, I have only one choice as to where I can go. So for any given input, this automaton is going to have only one run, only one possible path that can be taken by that input. That's why we call it deterministic. Non-deterministic automata can take different paths on the same input, okay? So imagine that I take this same automaton here, and now I make it non-deterministic by adding another edge like this, which is also labeled one. So now from this state, let me, go back to calling them Q0 and Q1. Okay. So from state Q0, if I read a one, now I have a choice. I can take this edge and go to Q1, or I can take this edge and remain at Q0. So if I give you some input, let's say my input is uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, right? In a DFA, in a deterministic finite automaton, I had only one possible run using this. So if I go here, let's say my input was 0, 1, 1, 0. So what would happen? I start at the state Q0. I read a 0, which means that I remain at Q0. Then I read a 1, which means that I go to Q1. Then from Q1, I read the second one, which means I go to Q0. And then I read a zero, which means I stay at Q0. So this is the only run of this deterministic finite automaton on this particular input, okay? But now I have a non-deterministic finite automaton and non-deterministic just means that I have some choices and finite means that I have a finite number of states and automaton is just automaton. So now I have this input, let's see what happens. I start at state Q0, right? I read the first letter, which is zero. At Q0, if I read zero, I have to stay at Q0, okay? Now I read the second letter, which is a one. Now I have a choice. I can go to Q1 or I can stay at Q0. So I can go to Q1 or I can stay at Q0, okay? Now I'm reading another one. If I'm at Q1, when I'm reading this one, then I have to go back to Q0. But if I'm at Q0 and I'm reading this second one, again, I have a choice. I can stay at Q0 or I can go to Q1. Finally, I read a zero. If I'm at Q0, when I'm reading that zero, I'm going to stay at Q0. And if I'm at Q1, when I'm reading that zero, I'm going to stay at Q1. So as you see, I now have more than one possible run, right? I actually have three different runs. So I could have Q0, Q0, Q1, Q0, Q0, or Q0, 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 Q1, Q1, or Q0, 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 okay? Now I have, many different runs on the same input. 
Now remember, in a deterministic automaton, I said that I accept if my run ends up in an accepting state. But now I have some runs that are ending up in an accepting state, for example, this one, and I have other runs that are ending up in rejecting states. So what do I do in this case? How do I define the language of my NFA? Well, I say that a string is accepted if there is at least one run over that string that ends up in an accepting state. So X is in the language of my automaton if and only if there exists some run of my automaton A over X that ends in an accepting state that ends in F. So in this case, this particular input is going to be accepted by this automaton. Okay. Now, non-determinism is one of those things that takes some time to get used to. Basically, the intuition here is that this is an infinitely smart machine that can also predict the future and it will always make the right decision. So whenever it has a decision to make, whenever it can choose which, tran which transition to take, it will always choose the best possible transition that would end up in the end making you accept this string. Okay, that's the intuition here. So in this case, if my input is this, I would like to end up at a Q1 so that it's accepted. So this machine is going to start at Q0 and then reads the zero, stays at Q0, reads the one, now it has an input. But now we believe in magic. It magically chooses to go this way because this is the way that would end up accepting this particular input, okay? And then it reads the next one and it's at state Q0. Now, again, it magically chooses to go to Q1 because that's the path that would end up in acceptance. And then it reads the final zero, it ends up at Q1, it accepts, okay? This is called a non-deterministic finite automaton. Now, I want you to think of the same problems as before. So if I want to take union or intersection or so on, on non-deterministic automata, what happens? But specifically, I want you to think of the problem of complementation. That's a very nice problem. So let's say I give you as input an automaton A. Okay, this automaton is going to have a language. I want you to output a different automaton, an automaton B. Such that the language of B is the complement of the language of A. So B accepts everything that A rejects. Okay, I want you to think about this problem and think about it when A is deterministic and also think about it when A is non-deterministic. One of those cases is easier. I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah.